All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we're excited to have you here in our virtual summit. I'm Erin Gangloff, uh, Managing Director of Programs and Membership for the Colorado Golf Association. So thank you for joining us today. If you were in ses sessions earlier, thank you for participating. Uh, we think we've got a real treat for you during this session, which is making the turn and finding your way to the back nine during COVID. So just a couple things up front for those that are still joining us. Um, if you do have questions during the actual session, you can use the Q&A chat at the feature in the, at the bottom. And Matthew and I will be monitoring those and we'll ask our speakers. Also, we have a treat for you. This is an interactive session. So we'll be using Kahoot. I will place as soon as I get done introducing our speakers, uh, the Kahoot link. You can put this into another browser or if you're not on your cell phone watching, you can do it on your cell phone um, and we'll make this a little bit more interactive. Uh, throughout the session. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Please help me to welcome Dr. Ricky Walker. Dr. Walker is a licensed psychologist, national registered health service psychologist, a certified mental uh, performance consultant, and an adjunct professor at the University of Denver. Um, she is also a sports psychologist for the U.S. men's alpine ski team, and in her spare time, she is learning how to play golf and playing golf. Um, so we welcome Dr. Walker this morning with us and can't wait to hear some of her expertise. And then we have Kirsten who is, Kirsten who is a doctoral student in clinical psychology and is a licensed professional uh, counseling candidate and is a certified mental performance consultant. She has also skied for Division I Alpine Ski Team and won at the NCAA Championship. And before attending college, she was an Alpine Ski Alpine ski racer competing for the U.S. ski team. So if anybody would like to take her on at the slopes later today, I'm sure she would love to race you down the hill. <laughs> Besides hitting the slopes and skiing, she has been playing golf since she was three. And if you can give any great recommendations for a good cup of coffee, she is looking for those today as she's becoming more and more in love with coffee. So with that, welcome. Thank you. Um, so go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, you got to introduce me first next time. So I don't sound so, uh, lesser <laughs> behind Ricky and all of her accolades, <laughs> whatever. I was thinking that I felt lesser in the <laughs> cool stuff that I've done in my life. Um, okay, I will throw out there. Fair. I was a softball player and that's why it took me so long to learn how to play golf because my softball swing is definitely inhibiting my golf swing. Um, so I, I want to say that this is my first group Zoom, and especially where I don't see the participants. So we're going to try to make this as non-awkward as possible. But please feel free to um, not only chat in with questions and answers, but if our cahoots are not working, go ahead and throw your answers into the cahoot, or I'm sorry, into the chat. Typically, the way that I like to run sessions is have them be more interactive in nature. So it's not that we're just lecturing information at you, but really wanting to know and understand what you're needing. So the way that today's gonna look is we're gonna start with two cahoots. And the first one is gonna be asking you guys, what are the reasons that you play golf? So maybe the reasons of why you first started to get into golf or even the reasons why you're continuing to play golf. Then the second cahoot we're gonna ask you is going to be about your barriers to playing golf or getting on the course over this last year. If the answer is COVID, one of the things that we're curious about is what about COVID? So was it health and safety reasons? Was it different values and priorities? Was it financial in nature? But to really understand what those barriers were. Then what Kirsten and I would like to do is give you two different mental skills tools in order to help get you back to the course. So the first one being imagery. So if your reasons for not being able to play or are reasons that you really can't get out there and play, ways that we can keep you connected to the sport um, from a psychological and physical perspective. And then the second part is going to be introducing goal setting. And the way that I'm gonna to talk to you guys about goal setting is that when we get out of any kind of routine, um, we tend to start to feel a lack of motivation. I'll go tomorrow, I'll go tomorrow. We get out of the habit. And the best way to be motivated is to start with action. And the best way to start with action is to have some structure. And so that's where the goal setting is gonna come into play. 
And then we're gonna end with an activity or an exercise that typically we would do with all of you and then have you share, but this is gonna be something that's more self-reflective for you on your own. And then of course, if you guys ever have questions or follow-up, um, we'll be able, we'll give Aaron our contact information or maybe we can throw it in the chat. And then that way you guys are free to contact us anytime after this. Kirsten, is there anything that you wanted to add to that? No, I definitely just want to reiterate that we are not going to be offended or feel interrupted. So ask those questions as they come up so we can answer them in real time instead of circling back to something we were saying earlier. So please feel free to jump in, ask as many questions as you need and want to. And we're looking forward to working with all of you today. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start with our first Kahoot. So I'm going to share my screen. And I think this is the first one. Yeah, so as you go to www.kahoot.it, you'll be asked for this pin, or if you're in the Kahoot app, 6840896. And what this is going to do is this is going to be, hi, Ashley, um, <laughs> asking your reasons why you guys play golf. And again, and I think I said this, but if, you're, if your reason is fun, I want to know what makes it fun. Is it the competition? Is it the being outside? Is it the training and learning new skills? Whatever it may be, but this is going to be a word cloud and we're just going to get an idea of why everybody is wanting to play golf or why you're getting out there. Let's see some people joining. I think, Aaron, do you know if I start it, people can still join, right? Or do I have to wait? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start it. Oh no, wrong one. That's barriers. <laughs> okay, go ahead and put in your barriers for playing golf or, or why, why you had um, some difficulties getting to the golf course this last year. So this is the prompt and now you have 30 seconds to answer. We probably should have had some like waiting music or something. <laughs> I can sing for you. Would you please? <laughs> no, I lied. <laughs> <laughs> Jeopardy music. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we had some people saying that it played, um, that they were able to play. Lack of tea times. Yeah, so a lot of people wanting to get out there busy at work, COVID safety issues, time. Um, if we were all together, the question that I would ask would be is, is what about time? So were there other priorities that needed to take place or um, sometimes too, weather could be a big part of it. And then in the times of day that, you know, weather is appropriate, then there's other things that are going on. We did have one more submission um, courses yes. closed courses closed due to COVID and limitations due to mm. COVID were there as well in the chat. Okay. Yeah. So definitely a lot of restrictions that were out of our control. And, and the assumption was, and Aaron had told me that one of the trends that we saw during COVID is that uh, playing time for men increased and playing time for women decreased. And we didn't necessarily want to make any assumptions about that. But the thought being is that, um, you know, needing to stay home if you had kids or grandkids and they weren't in school, caregiving became a, a bigger concern. Again, health and safety issues, so not wanting to risk going out. Um, so again, we didn't want to make assumptions, but this definitely seems like what we were what we were expecting was going on. Okay, so this will be the next Kahoot. So I think that we can, I don't know if you need to log out and log back in. This one is going to ask you, what are your reasons for playing golf? So either prior to COVID, when you very first started golf, or your reasons for wanting to get back out on the course now. And like I said, if you want it to be for fun, um, what about it is fun? I'll go ahead. And... My face is in the way of the buttons. Queen B, I love it. <laughs> Let's hold on to starting it, Ricky, for a second. 
that makes sense because when it starts the yeah timer starts okay <laughs> Kathy Klein, I can relate to that. I had spine surgery and running is not my thing. Golf is the perfect speed. <laughs> yes. Again, with all the balls that I have to go chase down and find, I'm probably walking about three times as much as you are, Kirsten. <laughs> get to see more of the course that way. Oh, exactly. I get to see a lot of it in some people's backyards. I got to see <laughs> a street one time. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go ahead and start it. to compete, spiritual, relaxation, competition, family challenge. Wonderful. So one of the reasons that we wanna know why people start participating in golf in, in the beginning is there's a lot of value and meaning behind it. And what can happen, especially when we take time away from sport, even exercise or activity, and especially if we have to take that time away when it's outside of our control, is we start to forget and lose sight of the reasons why we play. Especially during this COVID time, it's, it's been difficult and challenging for most of us. Um, one of the ways that I've liked to explain it is it's almost like having a sunburn. So I think at any given point, all of us have had a sunburn. It's uncomfortable, it doesn't feel good, but it's something that you can tolerate, forget about it at different times. But if something comes along, so you, you hit your shoulder or somebody slaps you on the back or you take a hot shower, all of a sudden that sunburn gets exacerbated. It feels a lot worse than it would. And that's part of what's been happening with COVID is that we all sort of have this mild sunburn. And then we have these stressors or these challenges that without the sunburn probably would be uncomfortable, but tolerable, where when you have the sunburn, now all of a sudden it becomes intolerable. So you, again, you take a hot shower. Sometimes it feels good. Sometimes it's a little hot, but you take a hot shower, the sunburn, you can't handle it. So then what happens is we get fixated or it's hard to not focus on all of the difficulties and distractions and discomforts that are going on. And so what we want to do is start getting back to the reasons, the values, what's behind why we started playing in the first place. And as we start to get more connected to that, we start to feel more motivated and more of that desire to get back into it. Any change for us is uncomfortable. And so even if we know that change is something that's good for us. So we shifted into this change of COVID and everything that we've had to shift because of that. And that initial shift was uncomfortable. But my sense is, and this is true for me at least, is that I've now become more comfortable in this new normal. And then the thought of shifting back or shifting to another new normal feels a little bit uncomfortable, even though that's something that I'm really wanting. So one of the things that we were thinking about, and Kirsten, please like interrupt me at any point if you have more to say, but one of the things that we were thinking about teaching you first, and this is where Kirsten's going to take it over, is teaching some imagery. And with imagery, what our hope is, is to help remind you, get you connected back to the spiritual experience, the competition, the challenge, the social, the family, the relaxation, the competition, which I already said. Um, and, and really get, getting connected and excited about those reasons again. Also too, because all of the reasons that you guys gave and reason uh, for not being able to play golf out of your control. So utilizing imagery is a way to continue to practice and stay present with golf without actually having to be on the course. So Kirsten, I'll go ahead and let you take it away. Perfect. So one thing I think that's really important to note to build on what Ricky was saying is that, you know, well, I think somebody mentioned arthritis in the chat. Yeah, Judy mentioned arthritis in the chat. And one of the things that we don't always think about is how much our bodies don't tolerate stress very well. So sometimes we think about somebody who's stressed, who's thinking a lot or is frantic, but 
you know, some of us feel it in our joints, like stress affects arthritis flare ups. Uh, you know, maybe you're having stomach issues, your body feels tired and lethargic. So, you know, I think one of the first things to, to consider during something like a pandemic, which is so unprecedented and for the most part in, in certainly in my lifetime at 32 is the first time I've lived through it. And I imagine it's the first time some of you have lived through it as well. And I think we're, we're all kind of learning what that kind of stress does to us too. So keeping those things in mind and giving yourself some, some grace around the fact that maybe you haven't gotten out on the course and that's okay. You know, other, other priorities have taken place along the way. And, and hopefully we can just give you some tools to help you get back out there or eventually or feel connected to the sport and give you some ways to kind of tap into that spiritual experience, the, the competition, the fun, the social when you don't have a chance to do it in a, a normal way. So for visualization, one of the big things that we talk a lot about a lot in sports psychology is a theory called the psychoneuromuscular theory, which is basically like mind, all your neurons through your central nervous system, and then your muscles. So they all talk and communicate really effectively. So when we visualize, we actually get the muscle firing patterns that we use when we engage in the physical activity. So to demonstrate this, I'm gonna do an exercise with all of you that's called the lemon exercise. So I want you, if you feel comfortable closing your eyes, please close your eyes. If not, just kind of take that soft gaze like you're, you're staring off into space and daydreaming. So letting your face relax, letting your mind relax a little bit and just listening to the sound of my voice. And imagine yourself walking into a kitchen where you feel incredibly comfortable. So maybe it's a childhood kitchen, maybe it is your current kitchen, maybe it's the kitchen of a friend's house, whatever comes to mind where it just feels comfortable and at ease. And notice if you're seeing out of your own eyes or maybe you're seeing yourself in there as sort of a third person, like you're watching a movie. And notice where you're standing. Notice if there are any smells in the kitchen. Any sounds. Maybe there are some other people around. Notice what time of year it is outside. Maybe the window's open and you can feel that cool breeze coming in on your skin. Maybe it's winter and you can you know, feel the heat of a fireplace or a stove or wrapping up in a warm blanket or your cup of tea in your hands. And then imagine yourself walking over to a counter in this kitchen. And on the counter is a cutting board with a knife and a really bright yellow juicy lemon. And as you walk over there, you pick up the lemon and you feel the texture of the lemon skin in your pan. And you bring it to your nose. You can smell that citrus smell even through the skin. You feel the weight of it in your palm. And then you place the lemon onto the cutting board and you pick up the knife in your other hand and you slice that lemon in half. You feel the knife as it cuts through the flesh inside the skin, cuts through the skin of the lemon. And then you pick up half of it and again, you just notice that weight of the half lemon in your hand. And as you bring it to your nose, you can smell a little bit more citrus. And then you turn that lemon to lay flat on the cutting board and you cut it in half again. So you pick up your quarter and now you feel the weight of that quarter in your palm. You feel the pulp inside. You can smell the citrus and then bring it to your mouth and imagine yourself biting into the lemon.
So now throw some, some things in the chat. Did anyone's like jaw tighten as you bit into the lemon or did you feel yourself salivating? Did you notice anything else? What did you guys experience with that? Mouth watered. Give it another second. I know I can never quite get to the chat quick enough. <laughs> I was gonna say, I, I, I know this exercise and even the lead up, I was, my mouth was watering and yeah. thinking about Acid salivating. Acid teeth, totally mm -hmm. salivating. Totally. I, so it's even, go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say, I can even feel just like the juices like running in my mouth and it tingling and shudder. Yeah. <laughs> I know, like chin tightens. Yeah, it's kind of like, so it's crazy how, how powerful this imagination is in our minds. You know, that lemon is, unless maybe you got up in your own kitchen and actually went over and, and took a lemon, my guess is you didn't, but you still had all of these physiological experiences like you were biting into a lemon, the salivating, the jaw tightening, the shutters, like all the hair on my like sh shoulders and back stood up and a uh, little sensation in your ears, exactly. So this psychoneuromuscular connection from brain to body is so powerful in sport and in so many other areas, you know, there's a lot of uh, imagery for healing. You know, we, we imagine blood flowing to injured tissue and it can actually increase the speed of healing. But for golf in particular, there's so many fine motor movements in that swing that go along with the big motor movements. You know, obviously it's a big swing, it's a big movement, but then like, you know, is your wrist have to bow a little bit in your backswing? Is your elbow staying in as you come back? Are you getting that full turn? So there's so many little things that we can imagine in golf that can really keep us connected to our swing and to the sport when we're unable to play it. So now I'm going to lead you guys through an exercise. And I know there's a couple different things uh, you all mentioned in, in the Kahoot about why you play golf. So I'll see if I can weave most of them in there. But I want you guys to sort of feel free and take liberty with this of imagining the things that really connect you to golf as I lead you through this exercise. So again, just take a minute to kind of feel your body. Let your eyes close if you feel comfortable. Again, soft gaze if you don't. And just notice where you are. So maybe you're standing, you feel your feet on the ground, maybe you're sitting. And then imagine yourself on the golf course in that perfect moment that you can think of where everything sort of felt right. Picture what time of day it was. Notice who's with you. Maybe it's your friends, maybe some competitors, maybe your coach, maybe people you've never met. Just notice who was around you in that moment. Notice what kind of day it was. Is the sun on your skin? Is there a breeze, an overcast? And really imagine as vividly as you can, everything about that day or that round or that moment on the course. Maybe you sunk that long 50 foot putt like Rory McIlroy and got that birdie and won the competition. What was the moment that you can think of as you think back on all your rounds that just makes you feel connected and excited about golf? Maybe you can smell the fresh cut grass or if there's a stream close by, you can feel the grass under your feet. Maybe you have a favorite drink that you like to drink on the golf course and you can almost taste it. Yeah, you can feel that warmth of the sun. And then slowly open your eyes if they're closed and let us know what, what did you notice about that day? What's, what were some of the feelings, sensations that you experienced in that imagery session? Happiness, <laughs> yeah. 
tranquility, serenity. <laughs> I love that. All things that are very important for right now as well mm-hmm. to be able to recreate that. One of the things I want to add uh, about imagery too is our brain can't tell the difference between, or, well, let me say it this way. Our brain doesn't know time. So everything that's happening inside of our head is happening now. Even if you're reflecting on the past or thinking about the future, we have physical, emotional, behavioral responses as if it's happening now. And so with imagery, one of the things that we want to do is use that to our advantage. I mean, how often are we thinking about something in the future and feeling anxious about it or thinking about something in the past and feeling guilty? Well, just as we can create those type of emotions for ourselves, we can also create the emotions of happiness, tranquility, serenity, excitement, um, you know, missing the family and that longing, um, even though that can be a discomfort or an uncomfortable feeling. I think sometimes too, to miss somebody actually feels good because there's a lot of love and connection behind it. Mm-hmm. And so, so this is one of those ways where we can stay connected to the game even when we're not able to play because of reasons that are outside of our control. I will say- in, 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 of, Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, there's also a lot of health benefits, you know, when we're in such a time of stress and turmoil and uncertainty to even have just a moment of feeling that happiness, tranquility. There's so many things that go on in the body that relieve a lot of stress as well. Mm-hmm. So if this is something um, that you guys wanna practice at home, which I highly encourage, um, <laughs> Kirsten can attest to the fact that sometimes I'll be sitting there and I'll even just make small movements. She's like, you practicing golf? It's like, yeah, I'm practicing. Okay. Is um, integrating all five senses. So our brain processes the world through the five senses. So sight, sound, touch, hear, smell, taste. I said one twice, sight, sound, hear. Sound and hears, but I said twice, got it. <laughs> Anyways, the five senses. And the more that we integrate all five, the more our brain is going to process and understand that information in real time. So as Kirsten went through the lemon exercise, she went through all five senses. It's okay if you do visualization where you're just seeing it, but you can really enhance the detail of it and the sensations of it through all five. Ways that you can do this too is if there's, um, you know, a, a different club that you've been working with or something that you're wanting to practice and you can't actually get out there and physically practice by using the imagery to see that skill and see yourself doing it over and over again helps uh, myelinate those neurological pathways. So that those, um, I'm trying to think how to say this without it being nerdy. Basically you're <laughs> building, building a highway to the like behavior you want to exhibit. So you're building a highway towards the golf swing you want if you imagine yourself doing those mm-hmm. movements correctly. Yep. For your body. And then the other way is through vicarious learning and mirror neurons. So, so watch people, people that play well, or even if you have tape of yourself from different practices or lessons where you were executing the skill, this is a way that you can use imagery to help reinforce that. So um, Kirsten, do you have anything else or should we move on to goal setting? Okay, so I have about 10 minutes to talk about goal setting. And imagery, again, one of the ways to stay connected, especially when you can't go, where I think goal setting is going to be important for us now is helping us get back into it. So we get out of the habit. Um, Again, there's a lot of different things that are getting in the way that we're struggling with. And so this is to provide a little bit of structure to help facilitate that motivation to get us back onto the course. One of the things earlier that I talked about was what really motivates us is when we have purpose and we can start to lose sight of that purpose. And even if I haven't been able to be on the course, I start to have those thoughts that, well, I've already lost what I've done, or I don't want to start so far behind or this or that. So goals and goal setting can really get us back on track and provide that structure. One of the things that I like about goals, and I believe that this document was sent to you guys ahead of time. Um, There we go. Is is that we often talk about goals and goals as um, something that we all know and are familiar with, but I don't think very many people do it well or understand it. The other problem that I see with goals is people tend to set goals in the beginning and never readdress them. So, So doing good goal setting makes goals worthy, but also then continually to go back and adjust, which I'll talk about in a minute, but going back and adjusting those goals. So it's kind of a crapshoot sometimes. Um, We're not very good at actually setting good goals. Typically we set goals that are too easy to 
accomplish or we set goals that are way too hard to accomplish. And if it's on either end of that spectrum, they're not as motivating as when it's that little bit of challenge that makes us that much better. One of the things that I often talk to my athletes about is every single day that you go out and train or you go out and compete, just try to be 2% better. And if you're 2% better every day, think how much better you're going to be by the end of the week or the month or the year. But if you try to think about being 100% better by the end of the day or the week or the month or the year, it can be totally overwhelming. So goal setting is really good for just being a little bit better, providing that structure. So the first part about goals is there's three different types of goals. And I only have two on here, but I'm going to talk about three. So the first one is outcome goals. And this is where everybody sets their goals. And again, I think outcome goals are really good, but they shouldn't be the focus of what we do. So an outcome goal is basically the desired end result. So I think about it like a paper map. If you're gonna go somewhere, you wanna know where you wanna end up. Like it's really important that once you start driving, you know where you're going. But what's really more important is the process goal. So how are you gonna get there? So this is how do you reach your goal by the end of the day? So for example, if you want to have better self-talk, so it's, you know, I get really negative at myself on the course, that's the end goal is that I wanna talk more productively to myself. So the process goal is, well, how am I gonna do that? Well, maybe part of it is learning what self-talk is and learning how to change self-talk. And then it's, I'm gonna catch myself at least two times a day speaking unproductively to myself, and then I'm going to exchange it with a productive thought. So if I say, oh my God, I suck, what am I doing? It's like, oh, that's an unproductive thought. So what I'm gonna say is I'm out here working on X, Y, and Z, or I got out of the house today when I didn't want to. And so just being able to create a little bit of shift. The third goal is a performance goal. So we typically tend to compare our performances to the performances of those around us. And that often that comparison is not helpful because we either see ourselves, typically we see ourselves less than, and so then it can facilitate those unproductive thoughts where the best kind of performance goals are goals against ourselves. So again, that 2% better. So am I better today than I was yesterday? If the answer is yes, how was I able to be better and how can I repeat that? If the answer is no, that's okay. It's just data. It's okay, so why was it no? And what can I do today to ensure that I'm gonna be a little bit better tomorrow. So those performance goals are, what, what am I gonna to do today? And then comparing myself to how is it gonna be different or is it better tomorrow? The last part of goals, and, and this is an area where I think a lot of people don't set goals, is looking at the roadblocks. So if my goal is to talk productively to myself and two times a day, I'm going to catch myself being unproductive and then reframe it into something more productive. What's going to get in the way of that? So one of the things that might get in the way of that is that I get too physically frustrated and I forget. So I just get totally caught up in being irritable and mad and thinking that I'm terrible at this. And now all of a sudden the day's over and I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't think productively at all. So if that comes up, what is something that I can remind myself? Well, a way to be accountable to a roadblock is maybe I put an X on my hand. And when I look at that X, it's like, oh yeah, that means to say something productively to myself. So we really want to plan out what are the potential roadblocks and barriers because there's going to be tons and there's going to be tons that you're not even going to know. And then that's where the next day it's like, okay, I wasn't 2% better today because this happened. So how can I plan to overcome that or avoid that for tomorrow? So those are the type of goals. So where it becomes really important is how we set those goals. So they're called SMART goals. So specific, measurable, adjustable, realistic, and time-oriented. Um, in these boxes, it should say S-M-A-R-T, but they don't. So with specific, we want it to be very, very clear. So a, a very unspecific goal is I wanna play golf better today. It's like, okay, so what does that mean? Same thing with fun, right? So golf is fun that's really vague in general. So it's to be more specific is what makes it fun, which leads us into the M measurable. So how can I measure that I was 2% better today than I was yesterday? So with the self-talk, it's, you know, I caught myself three times saying unproductive self-talk and I was able to change it three times where tomorrow I only caught myself doing it twice. So now that's measurable in that I feel like I'm getting, or I notice that I'm getting more skilled at being productive. 
The third one is adjustable. So this is the most important one. So there are no failures and goals. There's just data and information. So if the goals are too easy and you complete them and they're boring, that is data to tell you that you need to set a little bit higher goals. If you were not able to achieve those goals, again, just data, meaning maybe you need to pull back. Um, this is a lot of times when somebody's wanting to get into an exercise program, they're like, okay, I wanna work out six times in this week. And maybe they make it to the gym twice. It's like, well, that's not a failure, it's information. So what were the barriers? What facilitated you going those two times? What would make it three? So on and so forth. So always adjusting. This is where coming back to the goals. So I would say at least on a weekly basis, if not a monthly basis, coming back and adjusting your goals. And sometimes we get it right. So sometimes maybe we don't need to adjust it. And then that goal carries for the next week or month or so. Hey, the Rick, third you, one is, yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, just, so the, just so the attendees know, this is downloadable on the Women's Summit page, um, this document that we're all looking at, and then also will be sent out following the event. So if anybody's interested in utilizing this tool, that will be available. And if you have trouble finding it, please reach out. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, so the fourth one is realistic. So making sure that your goals are, again, not too easy or hard. When somebody's wanting to start a training or an exercise program and they tell me that they want to go six days a week, to me, that's not realistic, just based on what I've seen and based on the literature. And so it's, well, what if we start with one time a week or maybe two times and see if that, that's realistic? If our goals, again, are too big or too overwhelming, we get flooded and we shut down and then we lose motivation or if they're too easy, we lose motivation. So the realistic is how often can I actually get out there? Or how often can I attend this? The last one is time oriented. So setting daily, weekly or monthly goals. People tend to send outcome goals. So by the end of the season, I want this. And it's really easy to lose sight of that. Um, I think I saw a question and answer come through. So then lastly, so, so specific, measurable, adjustable, realistic, time-oriented. So this last part would be just ways to fill it out or write it down for yourself. So you have an outcome goal. So maybe it's, you know, lowering your handicap and the process goals would then be, what do you need to do that is specific, measurable, adjustable, realistic, and time-oriented in order to help lower your handicap? So maybe it's, I need to make sure that I'm training five days a week and within my training, I'm doing these drills for this amount of time, so on and so forth. And so you set three process goals. And then the last one would be, what would be your roadblocks to achieving those goals? So what might get in the way? And then how do you plan to deal with that? So what are some, some ideas that you're gonna hold yourself accountable to these goals, but then how are you going to make adjustments or changes when these roadblocks show themselves? So that was a very quick and dirty on goal setting. So like I said, please reach out to us if you guys have more questions about this. But we also want to, with the last 15 minutes, open up the floor to questions and answers. And Kirsten, if there was anything with the goal setting that you want to add, please feel free. Yeah, and just a reminder for those attendees, if you do have a question and you didn't hear us at the beginning, feel free to use either the chat feature or the Q&A feature uh, at the bottom of your screen, and we will be able to see those and, and answer them in a timely fashion if you do have any questions. And if you didn't see the answer, if, if anybody would like to set up an appointment um, with Dr. Walker's practice, that was put in the chat, I believe. If you can't see that, we will be sure to include that information um, in our post-event email as well. And I definitely want to throw this out there. So with imagery and goal setting, obviously we did it in the context of golf, but this is something for really any platform of your life. So if it's work, if it's, you know, fitness, if it's connecting to others, that, that these two tools can, can be used across a ton of different, um, oh, thanks for that person, a ton of different settings. I think it actually was accidentally sent to just the panelists. So I did include that to all attendees as well. <laughs> oh, perfect. I did, I did oh, that, you in, said early, that, Kirsten, I I did that you said in an that. earlier, I did that in an earlier session and realized I only sent it to the people that didn't need it. Whoops. 
it looks like one of the questions that came up is if you missed something in an earlier session, uh, just so that everybody knows, these are being recorded today and we will put them on the Cardo Golf website uh, next week under the Women's Summit page. So if you missed a part of this session or other sessions, you will be able to go back and review those. Um, so thank you for that, that question. And Aaron, Matt, if you guys have questions for us, we're open. I don't have any prepared, uh, so I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. Oh, how I miss doing stuff in person. <laughs> I think after this, I'm going to have nightmares about uh, Zoom silence. <laughs> so we do have one question that just came in. Um, someone's using my name. Any tips on breathing techniques standing on the first tee? Yeah. So one of the ones that I love to use with, with almost every athlete is what we call box breathing or tactical breathing. And the reason they call it tactical breathing is because the Navy SEALs use it to help manage anxiety and, and focus in. So the way that you do it is you, you breathe basically in a box. So you have a four second inhale, a four second hold at the top, four second exhale, and then a four second hold with the air out. And you do that a few times and it serves two really great functions. One of them is what we call resonance breathing or resonance frequency. If any of you are physicists out there, you can correct me on all this, but uh, it, it helps your heart rate and your breathing align, which calms your sympathetic nervous system, which is that fight or flight response. The other thing that I find super helpful that is just kind of a nice byproduct is it helps your mind focus on one thing when you're counting. So you're just focused on counting. You're not thinking about how's this drive gonna go? What if I miss right? Then I'm gonna have to get this club out and then I'm gonna have to get my rescue club and then I'm anxious about being anxious and then I'm angry that I'm anxious about being anxious and then I feel guilty about being angry that I'm anxious about being anxious. So one of the, one of the things that can be super helpful is to just give your mind some one thing to focus on. And so that box breathing of just in for four, hold for four, out for four, hold for four has all sorts of great uh, side effects from it. Mm -hmm. Also throw out there too, imagery is the perfect time. So seeing the shot that you want to hit, um, what tends to happen, especially when nerves and anxiety come into play is we start thinking don't. So everything that we don't want to do, so you know, don't slice, don't hit left, don't chunk it, don't this. And it's very much the, if I tell all of you right now, don't think of a pink elephant, what are you thinking of? So our brain is going to send our body to, to whatever we're focused on. And if we're focused on everything that we don't want to have happen, that's what our body's going to adjust to. Um, our brains don't register don't, it registers the command. So utilizing imagery to see, it's fine to know what you don't want to have happen, but really focusing on, so what do I want to have happen instead? What do I want this to look like? What do I want this to feel like? What do I want the sound of the ball off the club face to sound like? And, and taking, I mean, even just like three to five seconds to see it, feel it, and then you step in and you hit. Wonderful. We had another question come in. It says, sometimes I have problems dealing with other players that are being negative. Do you have any suggestions mm -hmm. on how to handle myself when other players are being negative? Swift backhand. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so with negativity, and it depends on your relationship with the players. I mean, one of the things that you guys can do is even talk about having a pact at the beginning of like, let's see how, you know, let, let's try to be as positive as we can from this. One of the things though, if it's, if it's players that you don't feel comfortable saying that with or people that you don't know, and this is where like the sports psychology and attentional training comes into play is learning how to refocus on yourself so um, maybe hearing what they're saying and then you can internalize a bit of appreciation of, I'm glad that I'm not feeling that way. I'm grateful for being in the sun right now or I'm grateful to be outside. And so we can 
re-internalize what we want for ourselves. It's, it's easy to get caught up and focused on that, that the negative energy. And so there becomes this attentional training of, I'm noticing that I'm paying attention to somebody else's negative energy. How do I turn it back on myself and, and be in control of my own energy? But that's definitely like a much bigger conversation. Yeah, I was hesitating because my first thought was like, uh, we just had a answer in the chat that said, don't play with them. And it's, yeah, it's like, Ugh, I don't really want to play with them. So if you have the opportunity not to play with that person, perfect. You know, we, avoidance is to, great. <laughs> well, we don't get, you know, sometimes we get to make the choice not to play with those people. And, and when you're in it, one of my favorite things is to interrupt negativity with gratitude, like Ricky was saying. So yeah, finding all the things you're really grateful for. And, um, you know, sometimes just, riding in a different cart or walking up the other side of the fairway, you know, kind of, it, it's okay to give yourself that protective space when you need it to. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And then um, um, we do, sorry, continue. Oh, I was going to say, I, I'm guessing that you were going to address the question about having too many goals. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Um, absolutely. You can have too many goals. You can completely overwhelm yourself. And so typically with the athletes that I work with is if there's a lot of things that they're wanting to wanting to work towards is picking one a day or maybe picking one a week. And so it's okay to, again, have, you think about if you're going to drive across country, great. You're going to have all of these destinations that you want to go, but you have to focus on one at a time because you can't get to all of them at once. And I don't think I finished my map um, metaphor, but with the process part, it's basically the turn by turns. If you're not focusing on each individual turn and where you are in the moment, you're going to run into a mailbox. So um, I, I try to have my athletes limit it to probably like three to five bigger goals and then breaking those down into like two to three process goals and then every day only focusing on one. Um, I think about it kind of like the jack of all trades, master of none. If you're trying to focus on all of these goals at once, you're not going to be very good at any of them. Do you concur, Kirsten? I do, absolutely. Our brains can only focus on one thing at a time. So focus your attention where it needs to go and, and things will happen a lot more effectively versus you know when the TV's on and the phone's ringing and you're watching something else on the iPad, it's like you never quite catch all of it. So the more we can do one thing at a time, the more effective we are in our efforts. Mm -hmm. These are great questions, I appreciate them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have about five more minutes if anybody else has any additional questions. If not, um, we do have a, about a half hour lunch break after this before we get started with our 1230 session. Um, and if you come up with some other questions following the end of this session, we'd be more than happy to pass those along um, to our two speakers here. So um, if, if something does come up after we end this session today, we'd be more than happy to try to answer that question afterwards. One thing I was thinking about too is uh, I often get this and Kirsten, you tell me how you answer this question, but people will say, well, what is sports psychology or what does a sports psychologist do? And so my favorite metaphor is basically we're like a weight coach for the mind. So you go see a strength and conditioning coach to build your body to be stronger and faster and more efficient and more effective. And I see that as our role as sports psychologists as well, is that we're training our minds to be most effective, most efficient as possible to help enhance our performance. And so we do that through mental skills training, through different kinds of physical training. Sometimes it might be mental health and psychological. I don't think that us as a person and us as an athlete are mutually exclusive, that the two, as you guys have noticed with why you haven't been able to play COVID has been a lot because of the personal life components of it. And so by building self as a person that inevitably builds us as a performer, but it is very rarely that it's something's wrong with you or that you're weak. And so you need to go get help, but more it's a resource and it's strengthening and conditioning what's happening in the mind. I had an athlete once tell me there's the cliche that sport is 90% mental, 10% physical. And I 100% disagree with that. It is very, very physical. Um, but I had an athlete tell me that it's 95% physical, 5% mental, but it's that 5% mental that really controls that 95% physical. And that I 100% believe 
So why are we not training or working on the most, um, you know, basically the gatekeeper of, of the physical components of it? I think also that sometimes we, uh, I've had quite a few athletes come into me, you know, a week before their big game or championship and be like, I need to fix this now. And, you know, they probably wouldn't go into a strength coach a week before and say like, you got to make me strong now. And so <laughs> one of the, one of the important things to note about all this is like, the more you use visualization, the more those muscle firing patterns happen, the more relaxation you're able to get out of it, if that's the goal. So the more you use these things, the more you train them, the more effective they'll be over time. Mm -hmm. um, the, the question and answer is that doing mental practice uh, percentage of synapses fire when actually doing a skill is a percentage and knowing what the percentage is. I don't, I do know of a study um, and the study is probably out to date and I'm sure there's better stuff, but it was actually downhill racers and they had three groups. So they had one group that, so they all had a baseline. They had one group that, physically train the hill. They had one group utilize imagery to train the hill. And then they had one group that did imagery and physically train. And what they saw were all three groups actually significantly improved in their performance. So even the group that never were on snow actually got better at um, training that hill, but the group that utilized imagery and physical practice improved the most. So I don't know what the percentages are, but I know that there's data and empirical evidence to show that um, utilizing imagery actually helps with, with performance production. Do you know? I don't, I wish I did, that? that's, a, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what, what the answer to this. I can, I can find out and we can let Erin know and she can disseminate information. Google. If I think about my round beforehand, and walk through it, then I'm probably, it's kind of like my mental practice before hitting the range. So if I did that as I'm getting ready before I even get to the course, that will help improve my round. Is that kind of where that's coming from? In theory, yeah. And, and, and even little things, you know, if you're visualizing your whole round or for me, I get this weird cock in my wrist back here and I end up slicing. So like I visualize this move all the time as in, in my backswing and that can, it actually creates those firing patterns. And again, I wish I knew the percentages between like actually doing it and visualizing it, but totally like you're saying, the more we visualize it, the basically like the stronger our mind's gonna be to execute that skill in the moment. Our brain thinks it already is, it has Happened. executed that skill. And so it's gonna wanna repeat what it knows. So the more we use imagery, the more we're telling our brain, this is what you know, so this is what we need to do. That's great. Well, thank you guys. We're at the top of the hour. So thank you so much. I know that I've learned a lot that I'm going to take forward this season. And again, anyone that is watching, if you have any questions or you'd like to get in contact, uh, please let us know. We will be sending out information post today, um, today, and then again next week. So if you're looking for that information, we'll get all of that posted. But thank you guys again for being with us and being a part thank of you. our summit virtually. And hopefully we can see you sometime in person. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that would be Absolutely. wonderful. <laughs> Perfect. We'll get you out at Common Ground, get you out playing with us. So yes, we appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. And I don't know if you want us to stay on or. No, you guys are good. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I will be in contact with you guys after and we'll chat. Great, Erin. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank I would you, love Aaron. to have you guys out for our Irwin players for sure. <laughs> I Done. love it. I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm and we will go play golf. <laughs> that Done. too. So, I, I, I have yeah. a lot of practicing to do. <laughs> Me too. So Visualizing thank you guys. All I, winter. Really, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I have not <laughs> Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Thanks thank so you. much, Erin. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.